So we were discussing about dynamic watermarking in the previous class. So I wanted to show you two videos about how dynamic watermarking has been used. Uh, so the first one is in the transportation setting. So I'm just going to turn on the video. And the caption will tell you what's happening. So a platoon is tightly connected vehicle system. Uh, they try to maintain the same distance between uh, successive vehicles. So all three vehicles are moving along the same trajectory and they are going to maintain some distance between them. So what happened was this vehicle's information was spoofed and sent to the other vehicles. Okay, so the controller stopped all the vehicles from moving as soon as the attack was detected. This is another uh, experiment by the same group. So this is the chemical plant stuff that you were working on in your assignment. Not the same system, but very similar. <coughs> So uh, what I wanted to show you in these two videos was uh, that, uh, so in the, in the context of autonomous vehicle platooning as well as in the context of chemical plant, uh, these kind of algorithms have been implemented in the lab setting and they have demonstrated that it is secure against autonomous, uh, against uh, cyber attacks. Uh, if I go back to this author, so he has written a lot of papers on uh, dynamic watermarking related attack detection algorithm. So they are also testing some of these attacks on vehicles, on actual aut autonomous vehicles or rather in this case human driven vehicles. Uh, but uh, this is something that's an active area of investigation on how to implement dynamic watermarking on actual vehicles. But at least in the lab setting you kind of know how these algorithms have been implemented in the past. Okay, uh, so that's all I wanted to show you. Now let's get back to the math, which will explain how exactly this thing is done from a mathematical perspective.
So I think we can go back to lecture 22 or 23. Oh, sorry, lecture 21 of this class. So I want you to remember some of the expression. If you can go back to your uh, to your notes, so you don't have to write down what I'm writing on the board because it's already there in your notes. But uh, but I'll I'll have to write it again. So x t plus one equals to a x t plus b u t plus w t. Y t equals to c x t plus v t plus a t. So w t and v t are uh, noises. Um, so these are, this is the actuation noise, this is the observation noise, this is the attack vector. So W T is mean 0 covariance sigma W, V T is mean 0 covariance sigma V. Uh, right. So we, we did the computation of uh, the Kalman filter. x hat t plus 1 equals to a plus lc x hat t plus b u t minus l y t. And we had computed residual r of t equals to c x hat t minus y t. The error signal e t is x hat x t minus x hat t minus x t and then we had talked about sigma r which is the covariance of the residual this was C sigma E C transpose plus sigma V. This is under no attack. Which means A T is identically zero. So this is something that we had talked about. We had done the derivation uh, uh, some time ago in lecture 21. I think that was maybe two or three weeks back. So you may not remember, but I wanted to write down all the expressions. Now the problem is, the attacker is just going to do a replay attack, which means that attacker is going to remember the past observations y1 to yt, and it's going to erase this whole thing, and it's just going to it's just going to send the yt information all over again. And then the problem is that it's very difficult to detect an attack of that type. So any replay attack is very difficult to detect. So now we need to do dynamic watermarking. Which means my ut equals to gamma t of so R and gamma is looking similar. What should I pick here? Have we used mu yet? Mu? Mu is mean. Uh, I need a policy. Phi. I think I don't think we have used phi. Are we using it today? No. Okay. C T of X hat T plus beta T. And beta T here is supposed to be sigma beta. It's a Gaussian random variable, random vector with mean zero and covariance sigma beta.
And the, the problem is, uh, remember the attack vector is such that, so AT, I'm picking, I'm going to pick AT, which is minus CXT minus VT plus Y tilde, I don't know, T minus something, T minus T bar. So some past observation, some previous observation that I've recorded, I'm just going to replay that particular recording and I'm going to erase whatever information is being transmitted from the sensor to the plant. And I want to uh, detect this particular attack. The problem is when this attack happens, uh, if you are checking for sigma r, to, if you're checking the residuals covariance to be sigma r, then it's very easy to fool the def de uh, defender in this particular case with this particular attack. So that's why we are doing dynamic watermarking, where I'm going to perturb the control u by a small noise. So beta, so beta is mean zero, but the sigma beta is very small. It's not very large matrix. So if you look at the eigenvalues of sigma beta, it's going to be like very small eigenvalues, positive, but very small eigenvalues. Okay. <clears throat> so let's try to figure out how do we detect this attack. I'm going to erase these two things. Okay, so let's look at, so this is my xt plus one. Let's look at yt plus one. This is c xt plus one plus vt plus one plus at plus one is equal to c a x t plus c b v t plus C B, I'm going to write phi T, but what I really mean is phi T of X hat T. So I'm going to not carry X hat T all over the place. C B of beta T plus C of W T plus V T plus one plus A T plus What about yt plus 2? Cxt plus 2 plus vt plus 2 plus at plus 2. Okay, so this is going to be a very horrible expression. Well, let's write it down. Uh, I mean, It's going to build our character, so we should do some character building exercise here on the board. So C A X T plus one plus C B V T plus one plus C B beta T plus one plus A T plus one plus Vt plus 2 plus Vt plus 2. Okay. Everyone agrees with this expression? I'm going to expand on this further. Okay, so let's try to expand it. You know what, let me, okay, let's expand it further. C A X T, C A B V T plus C A B
beta t plus c a w t plus dot 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 there will be lots of terms here. So, what you will notice is anything anything special that you notice here. So, I have beta t here that influences y t plus 1. I have beta t plus 1 here which influences y t plus 2. But what happens if C b equals to 0? If the column vector b, let's say it's a column vector, let's say it's a row vector, what happens if the row vector and the column vectors are orthogonal to each other? Right? If that happens, then this particular term is going to be 0 because this is a row vector getting multiplied by a column vector. If those two are orthogonal, then this particular product is going to be equal to 0, in which case yt plus 1 is not going to be influenced by beta t. However, what you will notice is yt plus 2 instead has this term CAB times beta t. So even if C b equals to 0, it's not required that C a b will be equal to 0. OK? So what that means is, whatever watermark you put in your u t, at some point of time in the future, it will start getting reflected in the observations that you are making. Right? Does that make sense? What we are going to do is, we are going to look for the signature of beta t in the subsequent observation of subsequent observations that I'm going to make and that's how I'm going to create my test statistics. So let's try to do that. I'm going to make the assumption that my phi t is equal to phi t of x hat t is equal to k of x hat t. I'm going to erase this side. No, I need to erase somewhere else. Uh, has everyone noted this side down? OK, I'm going to erase this side then. So my ut equals to kx hat t plus beta t. So this is a fact that was discovered in 2017, which is as follows. Let k prime be equal to minimum of all k greater than equal to 0 such that c a plus b k oh my both k's look same ok I need to make it look different So if limit n goes to infinity, 1 over n summation are t 
let me take capital T T equals 0 to T minus 1 RT transpose equals to sigma R and limit T goes to infinity 1 over capital T is equal to 0 then limit t goes to infinity 1 over t summation t equals 0 to t minus 1 norm of a t square is equal to 0. Oh, I have used E here. This E is actually not E, but beta because we are using E for something else. I have hope I have not used E anywhere else. Okay. This is beta. This is the residual. This is the beta watermark. And right. This is the attack vector. So what does this basically say? Uh, I'll let you guys write it down and then we'll start discussing it. Okay, let's look at this particular statement. So this k prime, this small k prime is basically the minimum number of steps it takes for the watermark to influence the observation. So if I put a watermark right now, it might take five steps for it to start influencing the observation. Let's look at this room's example. If I change the air handling unit's position uh, or the amount of air that is entering into the room right now, it might take five minutes for the temperature of the room to drop or to increase, right? So that is K prime, which is the minimum amount of time it takes for the observation to start getting influenced by the actions that you are taking or the watermark that you are implementing into the system. So that's given by this K prime. Now what happens is, what is this? This is the covariance matrix. Well, the expectation of RT, RT prime is the covariance matrix. So this is my RT and this sigma R is basically expectation of RT, RT transpose. That's my sigma R because RT is a mean zero random variable. So that's what the expression for sigma R looks like. Now I can't find out what the expectation is. Expectation is very difficult to compute because I don't know what the distribution of RT is going to look like. So what I'm going to do is take the time average. This is the time average. Remember, this is 1 over T, summation of T equals 0 to T minus 1 of the residual residual transpose. So I'm, instead of taking the expectation, I'm going to take the time average. And I'm going to do the same time average here. But remember that this is different from this. So here I'm taking the residual, and I'm taking the watermark transpose. But the watermark is not the immediate watermark, but K prime watermarks before, like the watermark that you implemented five minutes ago. So that's this particular variable. So you take RT beta T transpose, beta T minus K prime minus one transpose, and this needs to be equal to zero. So if these two conditions are satisfied, 
then it means the attacker is powerless. The average, average attack over long periods of time is equal to zero. Okay, so the attacker is powerless. This is like attack power, and this is basically saying attacker is powerless. So you can actually show that if these two conditions are satisfied, then the attacker is powerless. What is the contrapositive statement to this? Anyone knows what the contrapositive statement is? So A implies B. So statement, statement one implies statement two. The contrapositive is statement two, not statement two, implies not statement one. This is called the contrapositive statement. So this is the statement, if this holds, then this holds. The contrapositive statement is, if this doesn't hold, then this one doesn't hold, okay? So let's go back to this example. If AT is non-zero at all points of time, that's known as a persistent attack. So a persistent attacker is an attacker such that AT is not equal to zero for all T. That's called a persistent attacker. The attacker is persistent, attacker is constantly changing the observation yt based on its attack. <coughs> so what happens when there is a persistent attacker? What happens to the attack power? So if this is non-zero at all points of time, then what is the norm of at? It's going to be positive. And you take the average of positive numbers, you will get a positive number here on the other side. So the contrapositive statement to this statement is If attack power is not equal to zero, then this means that equation one and two doesn't hold. So what I want you to think is, now that you know this statement, now that you have seen this result and the contrapositive statement, how would you come up with a test statistics to check for an attacker's presence in this particular system? What would you do as, what would you come up with as test statistic? Any thoughts? What would you do as test for test statistics? Can I check the equation 
So you will check for equation 1. So sigma r is something that we already know, right? <coughs> 0 is something that we already know. All we have to do is take the time average of these two quantities and check whether it's equal to sigma r and 0 or not. Right? That's what we will do as test statistics. If this is not equal to sigma r or if this is not equal to 0, we know that there is an attack in the system. So I'm going to define this variable psi t as rt, the residual at time t, and the watermark of five minutes ago. And then the sigma psi is supposed to be sigma r, 0, 0, sigma e, sigma beta, under no attack. Remember that sometimes k prime could be equal to 0, sometimes k prime may be greater than 0. So you have to pick appropriate k prime here and you have to pick the appropriate residual here. <coughs> Any questions so far before I erase this side? So let's think about some of the scenarios. Uh, if you steer the vehicle, how much time does it take for the vehicles, the observation that you're making about the movement of the vehicle to change? So if I steer it at time t equals to zero, <coughs> would the vehicle start uh, moving in that direction? If I steer it to the right, will the vehicle, vehicle start moving right immediately? The answer is yes, right? Because that's a mechanical linkage. As soon as you turn the vehicle, as soon as you turn the steering wheel, the vehicle starts moving in that particular direction. So in the case of a vehicle steering system, this K prime is going to be zero because the effect of your action is felt immediately. Uh, in the case of this room, this K prime is going to be somewhere around five minutes because the moment you start pushing cold air into the room, the room doesn't get cold immediately. It takes a few minutes for the room to cool down and then the sensor reading would start changing. So in the case of this room, in the case of it, this thermal system, this K prime is going to be uh, five minutes. Uh, and depending on what one time step is, it could be five or it could be 20, um, depending on how you define your time step. So depending on the application, K prime would be different. As a result of which, you will pick different values of RT and the watermark. Uh, uh, so that you can see the ob effect of the watermark on the observation and therefore on the residual. Now the goal is to come up with a test statistic. So I'm going to erase this side. Any questions on this side of the board? Nothing? Okay. So I'm going to erase this side and we'll set up the test statistic for this problem statement. So all I'm checking is if psi t has this particular covariance or not, because this covariance is something I know. This is something I pick. This is the strength of the watermark. And this, uh, the, the covariance of the residual is something I can compute. So I'm going to define this uh, matrix dn. We are not using d yet, right? So I'm going to define dt as summation t minus l plus 1 to t psi tau equals to psi tau psi tau transpose.
So L is the size of the sliding window. Okay, so ideally in the best case scenario, I want dt to look exactly like sigma psi. Well, not exactly, there may be some error, but dt, this particular matrix should almost be close to this particular matrix. Okay, That's, that would be the ideal situation. In that case, there is no attack. On the other hand, uh, the alternative hypothesis is that there is an attack. So option one is if dt is equal to sigma psi, then no attack. That's one way to set up the hypothesis test. The other way to set up the hypothesis test is to check the log likelihood function of dt or rather the check the log likelihood function of psi and see whether this is indeed the covariance matrix of the psi that you are observing or not. And for that we will, we can use the second option. I'm going to define this function L I J X is already used. Um, let me use D. I plus one minus J over two log determinant of D plus half trace of d plus log so this is the gamma function uh, this is just an exponent ij i multiplied by j over 2 this is trace of d this is determinant of d log and then you check l raised to l m plus q, I think that is uh, dimension r plus dimension beta dt is less than tau. Oh, tau we have, no, tau we have not used, that's just the variable here. Okay, so that's our test statistics. This is our test actually.
So there are many ways to do this dynamic watermarking. We know so many different ways of checking whether this particular matrix, uh, this particular vector has this covariance matrix or not. So you can do this, you can do this, you can come up with a Q sum based test statistics because all you want to check is this is the covariance matrix corresponding to this particular vector that you have created. So this is one option, this is second option, this second option was from a paper in 2021. Uh, there are other simpler options available based on QSUM and log likelihood methods and so on. Also something that you can look into. Uh, but there are many ways to check, but the ultimate goal is to construct this particular uh, vector psi t. How do you construct this vector psi t? You look at rt which is the residual cx hat t minus yt. x hat t comes out of the Kalman filter, yt is the current measurement. And then you look at the past watermark beta t which is the watermark you have picked in the past. And then you want to check whether this is the covariance matrix corresponding to that vector or not. The stronger the beta t is, if beta t has very high covariance matrix, you will be able to detect it much, much quickly. However, that is not, uh, not good because you have a control task to achieve. You want to maintain the vehicle on the road within the lane. You want to maintain the temperature of this room within a certain bound, let's say 72, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so you can't really use very complicated watermarks, like very random watermark where, you know, a random watermark on the road is going to be like the vehicle is moving from one lane to another. How safe is that sort of driving behavior? Well, you know, when I drive, I see many such drivers, but that's not a safe driver. Okay, you don't want to be moving from one lane to another just to check whether your vehicle has, is under attack or not. So you want beta t to be small, but the smallness is determined by the environment you are operating. So you look at this room, what do you think, what's the range of temperature that you think would be comfortable to you? 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit? No? Okay. So yeah, so in this particular, so, so if you are in this room, you want to pick your beta t in a way that you can only, you can be between 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if you are at a data center, what do you think is the temperature requirement for a data center? So typically the temperature requirement for a data center is you have to maintain a constant temperature. The window is very, very small. But the most important thing for data center is not that the temperature is within a bound. The most important thing is that the rise and fall in temperature is within a bound. So you cannot have 5 degrees Fahrenheit change in the data center temperature in a matter of 15 minutes. Okay, that would be disastrous for the data center. I don't know why, but it basically leads to some thermal stress on the processors. I don't know what that means, but that's what I've been told. Uh, that the processor starts breaking apart if you let the data center temperature rise and fall very sharply. So that's why they maintain the data center temperature within a band of 1 Fahrenheit or 2 Fahrenheit and they don't let the temperature rise or fall very quickly. Okay, so depending on the environment you are operating, your beta t, the choice of beta t could be wildly different. Uh, but no matter what, you, whatever is the covariance of, uh, if, if beta t has a st high strength, you will be able to detect it quickly. If because of operational reason, your value of beta t is small, or rather sigma beta is very small, then it will take quite some time for you to detect the attack. But that's the trade-off you have to make as a system designer. There is nothing much you can do about it. So this, these, this is the class of algorithm that, uh, that was shown in the two videos that I showed you in the beginning for the platoon control as well as for the, uh, for the water system, water tank system. Um, of course, depending on the situation that you are in, you can come up with other examples where dynamic watermarking could be applied. The thing to remember is, <coughs> this is the most important defense mechanism or rather detection scheme when the attacker could spoof you, okay? So the attacker can replay the same reading to you and you want to detect the attack. If the attacker is not able to spoof you, let's say you, have, you are a system where there is no possibility of spoofing, 
then in that case you don't have to worry about dynamic watermarking. So dynamic watermarking is only for very advanced attacks where, uh, where the attacker could really change the observation to any reading of its uh, liking. Not always, this is not always the case where attacker could really just uh, replay the pass signal. So this is dynamic watermarking. Uh, in the next class, I'm going to talk about uh, the dynamic watermarking for finite uh, state Markov decision processes, which is based on our own paper. So that is something we'll talk about in the next class. So if there are no further questions, uh, we can adjourn and we'll meet again on Wednesday. Any question? No? Okay. So we'll meet on Wednesday then. Thank you.